So why don't we open the, uh, uh, the floor for uh, discussion, and I'll try to recognize uh, those of you. You don't have your placards in front of you to put up now, but I remember most of you. So uh, who would like to get us to started? I mean, I have my own list of questions, but I'd rather uh, give you an opportunity to, uh, to have the, uh, the Q&A. Anybody want to start us off here? OK, Marina. You want to identify yourself, too, just for the benefit of Ambassador Burke? Hello, uh, thank you for coming to us today. Uh, my name is Marina. I represent France in the simulation, Dr. Potter simulation class. And my question is, um, according to your point of view, how likely is a scenario when P5 states leave the treaty uh, if there is now consensus about Article 10? Because I know France is especially concerned uh, about a particular issue, and there are states which say that that is not important, and countries, according to the treaty, again, can leave whenever they feel like they need to leave. Um, how likely would it be that any of the P5 states would yes. withdraw? You know, I've heard that mentioned as a concern. Um, I think the chances of that are, are very, uh, are very low, if you know, or zero. Um, I don't see any, um, you know, I, I, I certainly, well, I, I mean, I hope that's the case. Um, it, would, we, it wouldn't be in our interest, it wouldn't be in any of the P5 interest to leave the treaty and have the treaty collapse. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, if you're looking at this, um, if, if countries no longer have a legal, are legally barred from acquiring nuclear weapons, um, you know, most countries won't acquire nuclear weapons, but some countries will. Uh, there's some countries with advanced technical capabilities if they thought they needed to do it. And I think, uh, I don't know that there's anyone, any countries right now that possesses nuclear weapons, certainly the U.S., and again, I'm not speaking for the government, I'm just thinking from years of experience, that thinks that the world would be a safer place if there were many more nuclear armed states. You know, it's, it's quite the contrary. So the goal is to try to uh, ensure that there are, are that, that, that are as few nuclear armed states as possible and eventually to get no nuclear armed states. So, so I think that's, uh, I, don't, I don't worry about that issue. But I, I have heard that some are concerned about that. Uh, Drew, please. Hi, uh, thanks again for speaking with us today and uh, for engaging us in conversation as well. Um, my question is, what ideas uh, emanating from outside of the United States do you think the United States should be prepared to engage with um, as the review conference approaches and at the review conference? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, any ideas that you have in mind that you think we should? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to answer that. Yes, I mean, perhaps a humanitarian initiative is a place to start because we just announced that we're going to be going. Um, also, you and I discussed this morning um, some of the papers that uh, that had appeared uh, yeah. last year, uh, in particular the building blocks. Uh, yeah. Paper. Well, I, you know, I think um, in terms of ideas that are out there, I think that there are some ideas of looking at the PrepCom papers and, and various proposals. There, um, th there are more states looking at this, I think, from a practical uh, perspective, um, you know, when there's talk of systematic reductions and building blocks. And I actually like the idea of building blocks. I know we're, the U.S. government's still using step-by-step but they've started to inject the concept of building blocks. I actually wrote some stuff for them about this because they're, the step-by-step -step sounds very linear, like until you do this, you can't do this, whatever. And the building blocks concept, I think, provides a, a, a better dynamic in a way because it includes things like an FMCT and you know, CTBT ratification. So there are things that be, could be going on simultaneously and you don't have to wait for this to happen before you wait for the other. Now, in terms of reductions, I think you do have to you know, we did New START. We were hoping to move on to follow on to that to include non-strategic nuclear weapons to get the numbers down, as the president said in Prague, to a level where the, the negotiation would be open to the, the other P5 and, and maybe ultimately others. Um, and we're just, we're, we're just kind of stuck now at this point, but hopefully eventually can, can move to the other point. So I think that's, that's a good idea. On the humanitarian, um, it's, that's a, a difficult one because of the direction that um, some states and, and, and NGOs are attempting to, to drive it, which is towards, um, you know, let's skip the middleman and go straight to the negotiations on a nuclear weapons convention. And I think that, that I, I see little, little chance, zero chance that the U.S. would ever agree to that. It just doesn't make sense. I don't think the P5 are going to agree with it. 
Um, but I have said and many times, and been criticized many times by colleagues who are in NGOs, that I think it's a distraction from you know, the, a real path forward, and uh, it, it kind of changes the subject in ways that gets us off message of what we need to do. Uh, so I'm hoping we don't get too bogged down in that. I think it would be better to look at the issue of consequence management. Um, and uh, not only a nuclear war, but I think the, the more real, the, uh, a problem that I think is, is unfortunately more likely is the use of, uh, terrorist use of nuclear uh, radiological material. And what are the consequence management you know, implications for that? Um, and we can talk about a nuclear exchange, I think, most of the countries are saying they don't want to ever see that happen. Um, but could we start at a, at a more local level and then go from there to talk about what are the, you know, you know, environmental health, what are the capabilities you have? I mean, I look at, you know, does the U.S. have a capability to deal with Ebola? You know, I mean, forget radiological. So I think these are real issues that the international community could, would be well served to address, how to deal with these kinds of disasters. Uh, Scott, I saw your hand, and then we'll get. Okay, I'm I'm Scott, uh, and I'm representing Iran. Uh, so okay, I appreciate you being here today. Uh, just but more significantly, you're chairing a court of reform. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. My condolences. <laughs> <laughs> for, for working group one. Yeah. Thanks. I've actually been getting that a lot the last year. Um, <laughs> we we we've tried to work on like the India, Pakistan, Israel issue in, in our working group and over the course of the semester. But we really haven't found a good way to to approach that issue or a good way to, to, to bring that issue uh, to fruition. Um, is this, in your opinion really, is this something that can be accomplished within the, the NPT or is this issue going to have to be outside the NPT? Well, um, I think for both of those issues, they're issues that are not going to be addressed within the NPT. Um, but let me take them separately. On India and Pakistan, neither one are NPT parties, and there has not been much appetite in, in previous review conferences to, to address the India-Pakistan dynamic in any kind of significant way. So the fact that, that India and Pakistan even get mentioned in documents now, I think, is, is a step forward. But whether or not there would ever be a movement uh, within the non-aligned group or you know, regional states to kind of put the attention on India and Pakistan that the Middle East states do for Israel, I don't see that happening. Um, and as non-NPT parties, any, um, anything that might be done to, uh, to address that dynamic and, and that sort of thing is not going to be done in the NPT. Now on the Middle East, um, I also don't think, even though the Middle East issue is the um, has become a perennial issue in the NPT conference. Uh, and, and it was, even before 1995, there was always attention paid uh, to Israel and to South Africa. Then South Africa disarmed and, and joined the NPT, but in 85 and 90 and so forth, they were always paying attention. 95, however, with the passage of the Middle East um, resolution, and I always say, I was there in 95, it seemed like a good idea at the time, um, that that then changed the dynamic, so all of a sudden there was a, a, a document around which countries could rally, and, and it kind of came to a head in, 20, in 2010. But resolution, you know, resolving the Middle East issue and coming up with the Middle East WMD free zone, and I saw from some of the papers the nuclear weapons free zone, again, the, the idea is that it's a weapons of mass destruction free zone. And, um, people will shorthand it to a nuclear free zone, but what we're really talking about is all weapons of mass destruction. Because while you know some they might be out of the NPT, there are several other states that, are not, that you know, have possess other weapons or not parties to other WMD treaties, CWC, BWC. Um, it's, you're not going to resolve it in the NPT context because not all the states in the Middle East are NPT parties. And so that's the, that's the dilemma. Now, will the NPT Review Conference continue to address this issue every time? Yes, it, it will, for political reasons. But there will not be a resolution of the Middle East. There will not be a WMD free zone that gets negotiated at an NPT Review Conference. So it'll have to be done separately. Uh, the NPT Review Conference can comment on it. They can discuss it. They can applaud it. They can criticize. but. It, the NPT review conference, I saw this in one of the papers, it's not a negotiating body. Nothing will get negotiated there. It, it, can, it, it can call for negotiations in the appropriate venue. It could be in the IE, it could be in the CD, it could be you know, somewhere else. 
but it, it's not a negotiating body. It meets for a month, and then it has these prep comms, but it's not in and of itself going to negotiate. Ruby? Right. Or do you Just want to really, if I could ask a follow-up question. Um, when you talked about the Middle East Resolution 1995, you said um, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Is it not a good idea? Well, I know I, I say that I, I say that sort of flippantly. Um, you know, it, in the context of getting the treaty indef extended indefinitely, um, it was the the resolution on the Middle East. Which, if you read it, it's a very it's it's not a very pointed resolution. I mean, 2010, the decision that was taken there had a lot of specifics about what needed to be done. The resolution in 1995 was more. You know, a WMD free zone is a good thing and effort should be made to do it, but it, it wasn't as prescriptive. Um, it, it allowed the decision to extend the treaty indefinitely to be taken without a vote. Now, you, you, you might hear there will be some who will argue that the treaty would not have been extended indefinitely without that resolution, and that as a practical matter is not true because there was an effort being made on the margins, the Canadians were running this, to, to um, collect co-sponsors for a decision to extend the treaty indefinitely. And the, the rules of procedure provided that you needed a two-thirds majority to, to make that decision. Um, they collected the names, and they had the requisite two-thirds in writing, and they continued to collect names. So um, the, that changed the, the, the dynamics with some of the groups there, because they realized, OK, the treaty could be extended indefinitely. But it was seen, I think, by most or by all to be a politically much more solid result if there was a, you know, there was no disagreement to that. And so the Middle East resolution was something that was put together, and then it allowed the conference president to pronounce that the decision had been taken without a vote. Um, and that politically was a stronger message. Thanks. Ruby? Hi, um, I'm Ruby, and I'm representing South Africa in the simulation. Um, firstly, thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, I was just wondering, like, looking back to President Obama's 2009 speech, he emphasized the role of U.S. leadership in disarmament. Um, and I was just wondering how you view the role or power of U.S. Um, action on disarmament in influencing other states' decisions to disarm, and whether you see meaningful action by the U.S. as a prerequisite, not only for disarmament by other P5 states, but by non-treaty uh, states as well. Um, well, I, I feel very strongly that the U.S. Um, can and, and has to play a strong leadership role on these issues. I don't know about prerequisites, but I do think it's important. And that's why um, when I saw the announcement that, that the U.S. has decided to attend the Humanitarian Conference in Vienna, um, I was elated about that. Um, I've been advocating, as Bill knows, from the beginning uh, that the U.S. should have gone to these meetings. I don't think there are any meetings that we should avoid. You know, we always have something to say. People may not want to hear it, but we always have something to say. Um, and if you're going to write the narrative on it, I think we should contribute. And I've made that argument. So I was elated because I do think that is a demonstration of U.S. leadership. Now, be prepared. When the U.S. goes, they're not going to all of a sudden get all soft and fuzzy. Um, they're going to, the position is the same. But the willingness to go and, and be in a group and have a conversation and put views down that you know that stem from you know vital national security considerations, not crazy, you know. I mean, this is all very serious stuff. Um, I think that's really important, and I'm elated to see that um, demonstration of U.S. leadership. Whether or not it, it uh, provokes others to, to do this, I have no idea. I've been trying to find out, but I haven't been able to find out. Um, but I do think that it's, at some point we need to do what we think is the right thing um, nationally and internationally, so that's good. Um, in terms of prerequisites, I don't know. Sometimes, um, you know, sometimes it just needs somebody to step out and take it, and then others can, you know, feel comfortable doing that. You find that an awful lot, and that's why on the CTBT, um, it, it's a shame that we can't ratify it. There, I mean, I'm going to lie. I think it won't get ratified in the next couple of years, or maybe afterwards. But uh, if we were to do that, we would step aside for those who are standing behind the U.S. because the U.S. is the target, and there's several other states that haven't ratified who are really important. But there's no one's going to pay attention to them because we're the big. The U.S. is the big ticket. I'd love to see us sort of step aside and have the light shine on the others and see what they would do. So that's a case I think where our uh, U.S. ratification of the CTBT um, is is would help would, would maybe encourage others to do the same. Right now, they don't have to do it. So it, it works. It's different to different circumstances. Thanks. Um, I think I, I actually saw Slava 
Michael, and we have our Chinese uh, representative, I have sure uh, <laughs> I will uh, add to our discussion here. <laughs> Slava, do you want to identify yourself? Yeah, my name is Slava. I'm representing the United States in the simulation class. Uh, thank you for coming for us today to, to speak. Uh, actually, I have two questions to you. Uh, the first one uh, will be connected with the NPT regime. So you said that uh, if we're discussing the NPT collapse, uh, it means that the whole regime collapse is collapsing. And you said uh, the phrase like, and you, uh, if, it's, if it is so, uh, and if NPT collapsed, uh, we would uh, live in a, in, a, in a new world then, right? But uh, is it really so? Is it the treaty effect? Because uh, uh, we can have two examples here. For example, in disarmament, you mentioned that it is very nice that uh, we have a disarmament issue in the NPT. But uh, now we can see the bilateral effect, uh, I mean, the New START treaty, for example, the US Russian uh, negotiations, or unilateral decision by France to disarm, or, for example, CTBT. Uh, we have unilateral moratoria. So, uh, is it really is the treaty effect that it works like so? But all the if we uh, have, for example, a weaker treaty, so uh, maybe with the effects of unilateral or bilateral negotiations, it would be the same. It is the first question, and the second question it's about um, partly you answered um, the questions about in India, Pakistan, Israel, but uh, I'd like to. Um, a bit uh, in a different way uh, to construct my question. So, India Pakistan, we have US India deal, but uh, it seems to some scholars that it's like um, uh, not very fair not to have uh, with it Pakistan as well. And if we have, for example, P5 plus 1 negotiates on Iran, but we have nothing on Israel. Uh, so, why is so? And uh, is it possible to establish some kind of um, more um, negotiable partnership with Pakistan and Israel. Um, okay, well, let me take the last one first. On India and Pakistan, you know, why not Pakistan? I know Pakistan makes that point. Um, I think they're two entirely different situations. And, you know, on the other hand, India and Pakistan, they don't like being kind of made equals or compared. They see themselves as different states. And I think the decision, um, I wasn't involved in the US India decision, I was working counterterrorism at the time. Um, but uh, Pakistan is a different, it's a different issue, and it's a different set of issues in terms of its program, and I won't go into that, but um, I, I think you don't, you don't say, well, we're, because we did it with, with this country, we're going to do it with this one. You take them on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, so that's, I mean, that's the answer there, and I'm not going to go into more details. Um, on why, why not negotiation with Israel and with Iran? Well, I mean, this is, <laughs> the, the important part here is Israel has never joined the NPT. Right? It, it, it has never been a party to the NPT. And, and Iran joined the NPT on its own volition, and then it violated the NPT. So they're completely different. And there's always an attempt to sort of conflate the two. But I, I see this as, uh, you know, you have a country that uh, accepted legal obligations uh, with all that that means for its partners and its neighbors and, and the rest of the world, and then it, it, uh, it, uh, it didn't comply with its obligations. And that's a completely different situation than a country like Israel or India or Pakistan, regardless of whether or not you like what they're doing or whatever, they never undertook a legal obligation not to do it. Yeah. And so, it, you know, they have not broken any laws. Now, you, you know, I did say at the beginning it's sort of an international norm, but in terms of the legal framework, they haven't violated any undertakings that they have accepted. And so to compare them, or to conflate them and say they're both the same, I think is a mistake. Okay, uh, may I just uh, yeah. a bit specify? Uh, but it's, uh, both countries are under criticism, right? So uh, I, I understand what you, are, what you mean and you're saying about Iran, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that uh, Israel case is not the issue. And uh, a lot of um, like uh, scholars and uh, politicians say that like they have no alternative to um, their OPEC policy, but it doesn't mean this is again Iran? Uh, Israel. I mean, like uh, they they have no alternatives f uh, for their OPEC policy, but it doesn't mean that it is not the issue, and it's uh, not worth discussing that. So why not like to negotiate that and to 
uh, work together on some alternative to this policy because it's it's uh, getting and getting older and older with a yes and uh, there is nothing to do for Israeli government with it uh, because it's uh, it's easier and it's better to stay the same position not to modif modify um, it some, some, somehow because like no choice so why not like like to help them and to, to disarm them because it's uh, the aim of the regime and the aim of the NPT or like whatever. Well, I, I think, I, again, I, I see them as entirely different things and, and talking about, you know, Israel's program, again, that has to be handled in a different context and, and I think, the, you know, if we talk about the Middle East at large, that's where those kinds of issues could be addressed. But if you're talking about the NPT, you know, you, the, the NPT regime deals with NPT parties and you've got a party that has been found in violation, it's under Security Council, you know, sanctions, um, that's the problem for the NPT, um, and that's why I say with the Middle East, if there's any, you know, any addressing of the Middle East that includes non-NPT parties, it's got to be outside the NPT. Let me go to your first question. If there was no NPT, would it be the same? Well, I mean, first of all, we don't know what the world would look like if there hadn't been an NPT, because we have an NPT, and so here we are. So we, we reach I reach conclusions on, um, you know, based on predictions, do I think the NPT has made a difference, and I think it has. Um, and again, it's not a force field, so there are some countries that have proliferated, but in fact, it, it could have been, the predictions were that it was going to be much worse. And I think if you look at the number of countries over the years that, that looked into nuclear weapons, Sweden, Switzerland, I mean, there were a lot of countries that, that kind of contemplated it. Um, if they had decided there were no legal barrier to it and they decided to cross the line, I think we would have a different situation. Now, if the NPT collapsed, would, would we be in the same situation? Um, you know, I, I, I can't say definitively because I don't have a crystal ball and I can't see in the future, but I do think that um, the, the chances of, of things changing and going in a dire direction that would be seen as um, unhelpful and possibly more dangerous um, would, uh, is very, very high. I'd bet real money on that one. Um, and it may not be the, you know, the usual suspects, but there might be other countries that are thinking, well, I now if I don't I may need to develop my own deterrent. And I think that the fact that technology, this technology is so widespread, means that there are probably many more countries out there that have the, te the technological capability to go down this route if they decided to make the decision to do it. So I just like, I would rather not have to um, see that, I'd like not have to deal with that in reality. I'd like to sort of kind of keep it in the box. So, so let me just make a, yeah. maybe a slightly different yeah. uh, perspective, because I think it, it over, I mean, as I uh, understood your remarks, I think it, it overstates the degree to which NPT state parties and the NPT review process can only focus on NPT states. I mean, because there, I mean, there's so many ways in which uh, uh, the uh, articles in the NPT uh, have a universal application. And so whether you're talking about nuclear weapons free zones, whether you're talking about responses to other countries, nuclear activities, I mean there was a major effort, I think not adequate, but uh, at least an attempt following the Indian and Pakistani uh, uh, tests to marshal strong sentiment within the NPT to con condemn those tests. Uh, there were provisions certainly uh, in the uh, some of the uh, review conference uh, decisions that were uh, kind of universal in their in their application, um, whether you were talking about trade with countries that don't have full scope safeguards in place or other uh, issues. So I think there certainly is plenty of room within the NPT context to address non-state uh, parties. Uh, so I, I, that's at least my uh, my my uh, I would I would take exception to your. Uh, narrowing of the focus of the NPT review process. Because I think just in, in terms of common practice, that is often the case. I mean, humanitarian consequences uh, as an issue that's been discussed within the NPT uh, is not designed only to apply to, uh, to NPT uh, state parties. So that at least is my Well, let me just say, I take your point, and, and I, I, I think the NPT review Congress has been addressing these issues, but his comment had to do with Israel posing a, a comparable problem to Iran, and I just wanted to, to say I don't agree with that when the effort is made to suggest that Israel 
is comparable to a treaty violator, and I think those are two different, different those are two yeah. different situations. And so, in the case of a, a, a country that has violated its treaty obligations, that's a that's a different problem for the international community, the NPT parties, to deal with than a country that has not joined the treaty. And that that was my that was my point. I do agree that the NPT should deal with these issues, but I don't think that these issues are going to be solved in the NPT context when they involve states that aren't treaty parties. Uh, um, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. I am Mike Dutzman. I am representing Canada in the simulation. Um, one of the things that's important to my delegation is um, strengthening with the review process. And do you think there is, one, any possibility of strengthening the review process? And two, would it, is there a potential for benefit to the treaty itself if the process is further modified? Well, what does Canada have in mind? <laughs> you can talk your working paper. I, 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 I last saw your paper uh, <laughs> several years ago. I, I, I mean, when we talk about strengthening the review process, what are we talking about? In terms of, because, I mean, I know ideas that have been put out there, um, and there was a strengthened review process document that was adopted in 1995. Um, but my own view is that um, uh, it's somewhat like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. I mean, are the countries coming into the, 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 the review conference? What's the Titanic? Yeah. Is this the yeah. No, well, it, it's, it's, well, it's like changing, you know, you move things around, but, you know, if, if the ship's going to sink. So it, it has less to do with where the chairs are arranged than it has to do with who's driving the ship and that sort of thing. So I just, when we talk about strength and review, it really needs a little bit more. Uh, Canada has had some ideas for this in the past. Um, and they've had some good ideas. They've also had some ideas in the past that were very resource intensive. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and usually these ideas are supported by countries that pay you know, a fraction of the cost. Uh, it's fine to say you want to create new standing bodies and mechanisms and things like this when it's going to be the P5 that are going to cover 55% of conference costs while the other 184 states share 45%, so you know, for most it's a share of about $2.99, and, um, and then the U.S. is paying a third of the 55, 32, almost 33%. So um, I think the last time I met with the Canadians when I was still working, we all agreed that uh, anything that entailed uh, new resources was probably going to be off the table because we just didn't have governments that would, would support that. So. Uh, again, I think strength and review sounds good, but we need to think about what are we, well, what what does that look like? What are we suggesting should be done that isn't being done now? And I think some of that is just coming in with a more constructive attitude and trying to find middle ground instead of um, having a food fight. Michael, why don't we can have that food fight uh, yeah. at four o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> Please, sir. No, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Hisham. Uh, I'm representing People's Republic of China in the simulation. First of all, I want to thank you so much for joining us and uh, sharing your uh, knowledge with us. It's really helpful. Um, I couldn't agree with you more that uh, the bigger players need to take the first step in uh, ratifying the CDBT. Uh, Pardon, that, the, that the bigger players need to take the first step in uh, the ratification of the CDBT. Um, and also that the U.S. should not be seen in isolation and all B-5 nations should uh, make their efforts in that regard. I have two questions. One question is uh, with regard to uh, the U.S. deciding to attend the humanitarian consequences. Uh, I was wondering what steps and what efforts led to that. And uh, my second question is with regard to uh, Pakistan. I was just curious to know uh, what you think is going to happen in the aftermath of the U.S. pullout of Afghanistan, considering the fact that certain restrictions were lifted uh, as a result of Pakistan joining the war on terror. I was just wondering what you think, like will there be more pressure on the state of Pakistan to possibly join the NPT after the war, after the pullout? Do you think anything's going to change in that regard? Just curious to know. Thank you. Um, well, let me answer the second one first. I have no idea. I, I couldn't, <laughs> no, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't begin to, to I'm not close to those issues and wasn't working them before, and um, I, I just wouldn't even hazard a guess that would be responsible. On um, the U.S. and the humanitarian conference, um, yeah, you know, I don't, again, I'm not, I'm not with the government, you know, I'm not representing the government. Um, I, uh, I don't know all of what went into that. I, I do think that um, 
Uh, and I haven't, I, I actually, I saw an agenda for the conference at a meeting in Monterey, um, uh, a CNS meeting in Washington. And so um, my, my hunch is that the Austrian organizers were, um, may have been more willing to, to listen to U.S. concerns and accommodate their concerns in terms of the agenda. Um, and I think that was not done before. Um, and so that willingness to accommodate some other issues in the discussion, like the whole issue of dealing with non-state actor acquisition of nuclear material to cause terrorist, um, terrorist attacks, um, and consequence management may have helped. Um, I know there, were, there have been a number of people quietly encouraging them to think about going, um, to, to say that you know it's important to engage on this discussion because it's not going to go away. Um, it's a legitimate discussion. I mean, the, the preamble of the NPT, uh, consider, you know, first paragraph, considering the devastation that would be visited upon all mankind by a nuclear war and the consequent need to make every effort to avert the danger of such a war and take measures to safeguard the security of the people. Um, the fact that President Obama talked about this in Prague, you know, so I, I, I think it's, again, I'm, I was elated at the, the, you know, when I saw the announcement of the decision, um, and I think it's the right decision, and we'll see whether or not other, and, I, and my understanding is it was made unilaterally, but we'll see whether other P5 go as well, because up to this point, the P5 have been united in declining to go. Can I ask one? Sure. Go ahead. How do you think this would, um, influence the other P5 nations, this move by the U.S., how do you think, uh, what the effects of that would be on uh, Let's um, Russia and China? Well, Bill and I were talking about that this morning, we'll wait and see. You know, I have my, I have, I have some hunches, but I, I just don't know. I, I think each country has to make their own decision. You know, P5 solidarity is a great thing, um, up to a point, and then I think at some point, you know, it's the issue of, you know, you need to do what is, makes the most sense. Uh, in terms of your national interest and that sort of thing. I think we have a common interest in doing it. I hope all P5 go. I think this is, it would be, this would be useful to engage on this discussion in December because it's going to be an issue at the review conference. But I don't think that the other parties coming to that conference should assume that because the U.S. is agreeing to go, that we've decided that we're going to, you know, announce that we've eliminated all our nuclear weapons and we no longer rely on nuclear deterrence for our security. Because the world, you know, I always think there was this great quote that uh, Secretary Schultz, you know, the four horsemen, Schultz, Kissinger, Nunn, and um, Perry, um, in one of the, an op-ed an op in, in 2013, and it, it just said, the world without nuclear weapons is not this world. You know, and I, I think, I'd love to see the NPT review process, you know, get back into a discussion of what are the, you know, what needs to be done to create the conditions that it will allow all of these countries that have acquired nuclear weapons to back away from them, you know. Um, and we, we haven't had that kind of discussion, although I think in 2010 we began to shift the debate a little bit more, you know, where there's a more of an acceptance of that everybody has responsibility. You know, the NPT is the game the whole family can play, you know. And we, everybody has a responsibility in certain ways. And, and recognize that there are security situations in part, parts of the world that are driving some of the nuclear um, policies of some of the nuclear weapon states. And, and also that the nuclear weapon states are not going to disarm in a vacuum or unilaterally. You know, so it's, it's more complicated. Um, so hopefully we can begin to move gradually in that discussion. I think NGO civil society can help um, inform that debate as well because you've got academics and stuff who can write things uh, to help inform that debate. Thanks. Amanda? Hi, um, I'm Amanda Moody, and I'm a research associate here. And I guess I guess I'm playing UNODA in the simulation. <laughs> <laughs> so Lucky I, you! <laughs> All those late nights you're gonna have. No, I have to grow a Tom Marker beard. Um, <laughs> I uh, I wanted to actually follow up on Michael's question about the strength and review process, yeah. um, and to ask you, as somebody who was involved before 1995 and then after. Um, how you kind of saw, saw the changes that had taken place after 1995. I've heard people say anything would be better than before when we would spend two weeks during the PrepCom talking about whether Arabic should be the official UN language. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard other people say it's never going to, you're never actually going to get a substantive PrepCom because people are always going to save their firepower for the review conference and so, you know, the third PrepCom, everybody's going to be holding out until the next year and the first two are 
too far in advance for them to kind of take strong positions. So I'm curious, um, do you see that review process working out the way that it was envisioned in 1995? Um, and if not, how can we kind of revamp the PrepCom process in order to actually have those be more effective? Uh, the, yeah, great question. Um, I Well, on the PrepCom, I, I happen to be of the view that, that people are not going to go to their bottom line until the 11th hour of the 11th day, you know, in the meeting. That's just the way it is. Um, but I think that the PrepComs can be more productive, and I think the, the, this PrepCom cycle, my PrepCom experience is very limited, actually. Um, and, uh, you know, I was involved in all the PrepComs for 95, but I hadn't done a PrepCom since then until 2012, because I came in after the third PrepCom for 2010. Um, I thought that the PrepCom cycle for this conference was probably the most productive one I've ever seen. Some of it had to do with, from day one, there wasn't the monkeying around with the procedural stuff that you've seen in the past. It's just a thing to just kind of throw, you know, rocks in the road. And so people got down to business, they had the discussions. And then you had the chairman, you know, Peter Wolcott in 2012, and then the, the subsequent chairman, attempting to collect in a report a record of the discussions. And, um, and I, I think this effort uh, and and I, I think these efforts were really fair, and they were balanced, and they were accurate, but they were still unable to gain consensus. And, and I think in 2012 it was because of one or two states only who blocked them. Um, but I think that provided a really good uh, record of where countries were. And if delegations took the time, they could study those to see, okay, where is their agreement, and where is their near agreement, and where are we very far apart? Um, and then PrepCom 2 was, was built on that, as I understand. And then PrepCom 3, they came up with some recommendations. Again, not consensus. But all of this can be useful homework for 2015. And so the PrepCom process, you're not going to agree to final documents in the PrepCom process, but if you use it as to really prepare so that when you start in 2015, You've got, uh, you've got some paper out there that already is indicating where you've got agreement. And if the parties could ever decide, okay, we're not gonna rehash that and give the same statements over again, and we're gonna cut down, we're gonna get down to the areas of disagreement, they could use their time more effectively and then be prepared to you know, agree, on, agree with, on what you can agree and then set the other aside instead of doing the all or nothing kind of thing. Because when it's all or nothing, it's, you know, it, it's always going to be nothing. Um, and I think the 2010 model was brilliant. Um, no one had any idea that Ambassador Cabecula was going to do that. But it provided a way of uh, preserving the area of agreement while still recording, you know, I think in the, the first part of the final document, where there was widespread agreement, even consensus, and where there were differences of views. You know, some believe, others believe. I've seen some of the papers you've done where you have some parties, others. That's a way to really be constructive because you can't agree on everything, but if you can say, well, there are some countries that think you should do this, and then there are other countries you think you can do that, at least you know where people are and you can move forward from that. So I, I think that there are ways to use the time better um, to avoid the, the redundancy and, you know, the repetition. Um, and I think the PrepCom process can really be helpful in sort of providing a launching point, and I don't know whether the parties are going to do that, but I think with the reports that have been done, they could be used as a jumping off point for 2015 and avoid having to have everybody repeat the same stuff all over again like they've never met before. Yes, Grisha. Thank you. Um, my name is Grecia, and I represent Iran. Um, and thank you for speaking to us today. Uh, I had a question about the um, how will the 2015 review, MPT review conference be affected if um, the P5 plus one negotiations and the framework for cooperation both fail, and if the IEA does not uh, produce a resolution concerning the past and present outstanding issues? That is a great question. Um, Well, I think, you know, I think if the negotiations truly fail, and I don't, you know, I, I don't know what that means, because failure in the eyes of some people may be success in the eyes of others, but um, I, I think if they, if they truly collapsed, um, I don't think it would be helpful for 2015. Um, and it would depend on why they collapsed, and it, it would depend on who made the best case for who was responsible for, for the collapse. Um, 
but it would raise the issue of compliance again, I think, and non-compliance. Um, so I'm going to be, you know, cautiously optimistic that something's going to come out of them. I don't have any, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know more than anyone here. Um, I do think, though, that if they are, even if they are deemed successful or conclusive in some way, um, I think the party should still uh, address the issue of compliance and the importance of compliance and the effect of non-compliance on the integrity of the treaty in 2015. And if they've been able to reach some sort of an accord, then the Iranians and others should be prepared to join that, that effort to come up with a strong statement by the parties uh, about the, the critical importance of full compliance with the treaty. And they, they should be able to do it. And, and if they have been able to reach some sort of an accord, then it would not be seen as targeting anybody. It would just be seen as the parties pronouncing themselves on this critical issue. Susan, if I can ask uh, uh, two, uh, two questions here. Um, I was, I don't know, surprised is the right word, but I'll use it. I was somewhat surprised at meetings that we held in New York recently uh, about the uh, strength of the view that it simply would not be possible to repeat the process of the 2010 uh, conference where uh, we had uh, a consensus document with respect to the forward-looking part of the, uh, the document uh, and the chair's uh, uh, statement with respect to the, uh, the review portion. Um, I thought that, I mean, I, I was simply struck by the uh, convergence of strong views that that would not fly again. So that, my question is whether you, you know, kind of concurred with that assessment. Um, and the second, uh, which is maybe a little bit more uh, difficult uh, question, um, how do you think the review conference will actually deal with the 2010 action plan? Uh, because you have a hodgepodge of, of, uh, of uh, kind of benchmarks, the things which really are, are, are not benchmarks. Uh, there are those who would like some of these just to roll over for the next review conference. There are other countries that have made it very clear that they think that we have to, that is, the, the state's parties have to assess to some extent themselves uh, implementation of the different items, uh, prioritize among the items, and perhaps even set more uh, timelines in terms of their, their implementation. And I don't know how the conference really, you know, grapples with that mix of uh, approaches. I'd be curious how you think they should and will uh, deal with that issue, which they'll, they'll have to address in right, some fashion. Right, right. Okay. Well, on the first question, um, I, I picked that up, I think, from some things I saw from meetings that you had had in Annecy and others. I wasn't there, but, you know, my sources about the 2010 process. Um, you'll have to tell me later who, who's, who's making these points. I, the only reason I, I think you would argue against this process is if um, you were determined to, um, well, if you, if you were prepared to have there be no result, and I think that could be, for various reasons, it might be to keep certain, hold certain countries' feet to the fire, or it could be to sort of show that the process is not effective. Um, and maybe there's a thought that if you agree now to this sort of bifurcated process that it takes the pressure off of countries. Um, and I hadn't really thought about it that way. But I, I do think it was a brilliant way of um, getting to, to some sort of result. And, um, and I, I think it, it's a much more effective, um, a, a much more effective outcome than these long mammoth documents that cover everything that are consensus that, you know, I think that, that this, because it had a part of it that was consensus as action plan, I think it was politically more important. And I think at least for the United States, when I was there, they took this very seriously. One of the first things that happened after the review conference is the NSC called a meeting to go over the action plan to come up with or sub-action, okay, how are we going to implement this, how are we going to implement the not, you know, whatever, it was taken that seriously. I think when you have these long, rambling documents that cover everything from soup to nuts, 
it's the usual thing, and I don't think they get they don't get the kind of attention, the kind of follow-on attention, um, and and not only in in the government that I was working in, but in other governments as well. I don't think people pay attention. The action plan got people's attention, and they took it as something different. Um, I also don't think that the likelihood of agreeing on everything in any meaningful way is very high. And I think when you water everything down, it becomes less valuable than if you try to tease out those, those key issues on which you can agree and then try to work on them. Um, so we'll have to see how it goes. I, I, there was also a lot of um, unhappiness, not a lot, but some unhappiness with the fact that the 2010 president kept everything to a tight schedule. Um, and did not allow this to just go on and on, you know, indefinitely, to, and, and people were unhappy about that. One, one refrain that I heard frequently from one key delegation, who I shall not name, was, but we've never done it this way. And I finally said, well, you know what, I've been involved in this several other times, and the way we've always done it doesn't work, so I think we should support the chairman, <laughs> the president, and give him an opportunity to try it another way, because, you know, the way we've always done it is not effective most of the time. Um, and so there's some of that, too. We've never done it this way. I think, you know, again, parties need to be open to finding new ways to, you know, to skin this cap. Um, but the fact that you're hearing strong views, uh, I think this, this isn't a good sign, unfortunately, but maybe it's not surprising. Um, how will they deal with the action plan? That's the $64,000 question. And I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how to do that. Now, um, I, I think there are various ways to do it. I, I don't think we should take the action plan as it's been builded and you know it's put on a shelf somewhere. I think the idea was it's not, it's, it's not, um, it's not a deadline. It's an action plan. It's a blueprint for how to get to better implementation of the disarm and non-proliferation peaceful uses piece of it. Now, as a practical matter, the disarm piece is much more action-oriented. And I think for some governments, uh, the fact that so much was given on disarmament and so little was got, gotten on non-proliferation and peaceful uses is something that some people, we heard a lot of that um, about, that, that may, that may um, undermine the argument that if you are more forward-leaning on these issues, you're going to get more front. That didn't turn out. So I think if that continues, again, that's going to be very problematic for some governments that would like to be more forward-leaning on disarmament. If they're not getting anything for it, there's not going to be any political appetite to do that. Um, but I think you've got this action plan, and I, I don't know what people are planning to do, but I, I, would, I would take it and I'd look at, um, you know, how, how have you know, how have things been done? Some of these things may have been achieved. Some of them, maybe they just need to be updated and tweaked. Maybe some new things need to be added. You know, they talk about 64 actions. There really aren't 64 actions. Um, there are a number of, you know, if you, you can combine three or four of them into one action because they're just variations on a theme, you know, on one thing. So um, could some tightening be done to it? So it really comes down to actions. Um, would MPT parties be willing to put some more actions in about the additional protocol? Maybe not, if that has to be a consensus. Could there be something on it about compliance? You know, there's some other things that certainly, from the perspective of at least one government, um, it was very, very weak on, on critical issues there. Um, could there be more on disarmament? I, you know, I think there probably could be. Are you going to get all P5 to agree to it? I don't know the answer to that. Um, even if one government or two or three went along with it, could you get all five? Um, you know, the moratorium, fissile material moratorium was an agreement, four out of five agreed with that, but it wasn't in the action plan because one country would not support it. So, um, you know, it's hard to know, but I do think that it's a unique device that was created, and I think if the parties decide to embrace it and to update it um, and to carry it forward for the next five years, you, you might be onto something useful then, and then it, I think it takes on more legitimacy as a, as a blueprint or a roadmap for moving forward. Uh, so I would, I would, I guess I hope that, that it continues to be used and it gets updated. Um, in terms of the rest of the stuff, the other issues, uh, if you could get all the parties to agree on all the issues, that would be wonderful. And, and an effort should be made to continue to come up with as much a consensus agreement on the other wide range of issues as possible. But I don't think the conference should be deemed a failure if uh, one country, because I mean, let's face it, one country can block the consensus. And at least in 2010, there was at least one country that would have been prepared to do that. So d does everyone else get held hostage to that? Or do you just you come up with a report that reflects very clearly that on, on most issues, there's consensus or consensus minus one or two. And on a few issues, you've got some states that are here and some states that are there. I mean, is that a terrible outcome? I don't, I don't think so. 
So I, I have to ask those who are opposed to this, what's so terrible about this outcome? Unless it's the idea that it it's, uh, would take pressure off of countries. I, I think, you know, I think at least, I, I think for the United States, I, I don't know, but um, in the past we've always felt under tremendous pressure on the MPT Review Conference because the MPT is so important as a national security tool for the, for the United States. So, you know, maybe in 20, 2005, but I think, you know, most of the time um, it, we take these, these meetings very, very seriously and uh, feel under tremendous pressure to, to try to make the most of them. Well, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, you really gave us, I think, an extraordinarily comprehensive look. Uh, you didn't uh, disappoint me in terms of being provocative on a number of points. Uh, and uh, in a couple of hours, you're going to lose the luxury of being able to speak simply as a private citizen. You'll have to be addressed again okay. as the distinguished representative from the United States. So okay. for those of you who are looking forward to learning more about the U.S. perspective, uh, please join us in this room at 4 o'clock. Okay. Please join me also in thanking uh, the guys.